23 of Luke 24, and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And they thus spake. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. We see in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 16, and in verse 14, that afterward he had appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Folks, the eleven were caught in unbelief. Jesus, having appeared unto them, catching them, doubting and wondering whether or not he had been resurrected. Now, they should have known that he was going to be resurrected. As a matter of fact, back in Luke chapter 24... And in verse 6, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Jesus had made it clear what it was that he was going to do. He had explained to the apostles and his disciples what his mission was and how he would indeed Return unto them. We likewise see him explaining this in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, there in verse 33, he says, Little children, yet a little while, when I am with you, ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. They shouldn't have been surprised. They shouldn't have been confused. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 10, he likewise says, in verse 17, therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Folks, the disciples and the apostles of Jesus Christ were given every indication, were given every word necessary to believe and understand regarding the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. However, after Jesus had died, they had been doubting and they had been wondering whether or not the cause of Christ was going to continue. Whether or not the words of Jesus were really true. And so Jesus appeared unto them and caught them in the midst of their unbelief. Now we all know that feeling of being caught. We all know what it's like when we've done something wrong and the person that has told us not to do that something wrong appears unto us and catches us as we say it, quote, red-handed. Now, we're not going to be caught like the disciples and the apostles were caught in the first century by Jesus. He's not going to appear unto us. He's not going to uh, all of a sudden be standing before us and asking us why it is we are doing what we are doing or why it is we're unbelieving in him and in his words. However, we do have his word before us. And we can challenge ourselves whether or not we are caught in unbelief right now. Are we caught in unbelief because we are thinking that today is a day that makes us holy? See, over the last several days, the denominational world has been engaging in what is called Holy Week. It is a week that is sanctified, a week that is separate, a week that is given special attention by the denominational world, which ultimately comes from the authority of the Pope. 
And the Catholic Church itself has decrees and days that they define as, quote, holy days of obligation. These are days that are supposed to be observed and are supposed to be uh, given special attention. And if a Catholic wants to be a faithful Catholic, then he may be able to ignore other days throughout the year. But as long as the holy days of obligation are observed, then this Catholic can be acceptable in regards to his involvement with the Catholic Church. And so therefore, we have a society today that looks upon days such as December 25th and the first Sunday of April as very special, holy days. But folks, if we are thinking today makes us holy, if we are thinking that this is a holy day, then we are caught in unbelief. See, we learn throughout the New Testament that God's people had a certain practice regarding their worship. As a matter of fact, Brother Larry mentioned just a few minutes ago the fact that we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. We see in Acts chapter 20 and in verse 7, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Here they were on the first day of the week gathering together. Paul was waiting there so that he could attend the worship services of the church with these brethren and break bread with them that is partaking of the Lord's Supper in order to memorialize, remember the great sacrifice of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, we read, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul understood, based upon his commandments, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, based upon the behavior and practices of the first century church, that they were coming together on the first day of every week in order to worship God. And so therefore, upon doing so, Paul is giving commandment that it would be on that day that they were likewise to take a collection for the saints. See, it's the first day of every week when we have the opportunity to remember and show or proclaim the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning there in verse 23, Paul here again commanding them regarding what it was that they were to be doing on the first day of the week. I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show or proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Folks, we have an opportunity to remember Jesus and his sacrifice, to remember his resurrection on the first day of every week. What a blessing that is that the Lord has prescribed for us this formula. That indeed it is not routine, but it is something that provokes us to appreciate and to think more deeply regarding the love that our Lord has for us. No, this day is not more holy than any other day. This day is the Lord's day. It is the first day. It is the day when we get to come together to worship Him. But what is Holy. What is supposed to be holy? Well, it's not a day, but it rather is our behavior. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning there in verse 15, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. See, our God is holy in that he is sanctified. He is separate from this world. He is above this world. He is deity. And God's people are able to be saints. That is, they themselves are able to be sanctified. 
because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, as he was writing the churches in the first century, in some cases would refer to them as saints. Take, for example, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. These brethren in Philippi are being referred to as saints. In other words, they are separated from the daily behaviors and practices of the world and are rather so living for God. Paul will explain to the brethren in Corinth in his second letter in chapter 6, beginning there in verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, folks, many of us are familiar with this type of teaching. Brethren, you've probably heard multiple sermons along these lines. Easter after Easter after Easter. But, nevertheless, the idea and the thought is still there by our neighbors and friends. And we, as well as our children, are constantly bombarded and tempted with thinking this idea that today is, quote, an Easter holiday. In other words, in the religious sense, it is a holy separate day where we are to spend and pay special attention to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Folks, that's not what being holy is all about. That's man's wisdom. That's compartmentalizing religion. It's saying, I'm going to go live and do what I want to go do, but I'm going to make sure I pay special close attention to these holy days of obligation. And on Easter Sunday, I'm going to be on my best behavior. And I'm going to think holy things and holy thoughts. And then I can just go off and continue doing whatever it is I want to go. Folks, if we are thinking that, then we are caught in unbelief. We're caught in unbelief if we think this day is holy. But we're also caught in unbelief if we're thinking tomorrow is not about the resurrection as well. See, every day is about the resurrection. Paul writes to the brethren, once again in Corinth, in the uh, in the second letter, chapter one. Excuse me, the first letter, chapter one, in verse seven. He explains unto them that they are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus. As he writes the brethren in Thessalonica in the first letter, in chapter 1 and in verse 10, he's likewise explaining to them what it is they are waiting for. They are waiting for his son, God, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. He will write once again to the brethren in Corinth in the second letter in chapter 4 and in verse 16. That though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. See, folks, those who are children of God, don't just put the resurrection of Jesus Christ over here in a bucket somewhere and say, you know what? When the time comes, I'll just go pull that out and start to think about it a little bit. But rather, children of God are waiting, longing for the return of Jesus Christ, knowing that he has been resurrected and knowing that the life that they live on a daily basis, hour in and hour out, is not based upon their physical flesh, is not based upon their outward body, is not based upon this temporal world, but is instead being renewed, being refreshed, being reinvigorated, being resurrected, Every moment 
because of the word of God. Folks, we are caught in unbelief if we are thinking that tomorrow and the rest of this year and the rest of our life, except for the first Sunday in April, is not about the resurrection. Our lifestyle as Christians, our purpose, our longing is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he commanded us to take up our cross daily and follow after him. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. We have put ourselves to death and therefore we look forward to that time when we can once again be with our Lord for all of eternity when he returns. Thinking tomorrow is not about the resurrection being caught in unbelief. Maybe we're caught in unbelief because we are thinking that we can put off salvation in Jesus Christ. We can continue to delay it. We can continue to put it off and evaluate and determine whether or not Jesus is the source that we need to look to, that we need to obey in order to be saved. In Acts chapter 4 and in verse 12, we read the words of Peter, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Folks, there is no other source that has the power of salvation from our sins other than Jesus Christ. There is no other time other than right now if we understand that as to when we ought to obey him. You might think, well, I've been opposed to the church my whole life. I've not been aligned with the church of Christ. I've not been in step with the church of Christ. I've been living in a way that is, is so far off from how God's people live why should now be the time that I obey? I, I, I'm, I'm too, too off. Well, folks, there was one in the first century who I guarantee you was a lot farther off than you are. How do I know that? Well, because he was consenting and was involved in the murdering of the church. And upon murdering God's people, he eventually learned that that wasn't God's will. And he needed to go and find out what it was that he was responsible for in order to be saved. And in Acts chapter 22, we see that one named Ananias comes unto Paul and asks him in verse 16, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now folks, Saul was far off from the Lord's people. So far off that he was persecuting and trying to diminish and destroy them. Yet, he was asked, why are you waiting? Why are you delaying? Why are you putting it off any longer? You want to be right with God? Now is your opportunity. Now you can be saved. Now you can call upon him. You can have your sins washed away. How so? By being baptized. Saul obeyed the gospel. Saul was baptized into Christ. <coughs> Saul, after that day, was no longer caught in unbelief, thinking that he could continue to put off salvation. Now here's a question for you. Are you going to be walking out this door this morning 
thinking that you can continue to delay and prolong what it is you now know you need to do. Being baptized into Christ. Because if you do not obey, you may get caught in unbelief. But the type of unbelief that you will get caught in, if you don't obey the gospel, is the unbelief that involves the punishment that comes for those who refuse to obey and do what the gospel says. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning there in verse 7, Paul by inspiration writes, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall punish, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You have an opportunity right now to be aware that you are caught in unbelief and fix it and not put off your salvation any longer, making it right with God before it's everlastingly too late. Are you caught in unbelief this morning? Brother or sister, maybe you have stopped living holy. Maybe you have been persuaded by the world and the allurement and the temptation that Satan brings with him throughout. And you've fallen away. And you know this. And you know that everyone around you knows this. And you know it's time to be restored. You know it's time to come on home. If that's the case, won't you do so? We want to pray for you. We want to help you. If you're here this morning and you're ready to be right with God for all of eternity,